Amen. Thank you. And be in continuing prayer for Gabrielle and the church at NASA as they work through this time. But we'll transition now, if you would, turn in your Bibles again, if you're not still there, to Genesis chapter 2. And we'll continue our study through this incredible book, in particular looking here at the creation of marriage. As we begin, we look at this question and ask, what is marriage? And perhaps in our time, this question hasn't been considered so carefully as it is now with so much changes and so, many, so much upheaval in our society on this question. Our question, this society that we're in has been asking this question with fresh vigor. Debates have been swirling about what marriage most fundamentally is and what it's there for and who can participate in it. And these debates have been challenging the status quo about marriage, our culture's understanding of marriage. And given that marriage is that most significant building block of our society, that most fundamental relationship in our societal life, our government's tried to clarify things and define for us, even for our commonwealth and our country, what marriage is, trying to lay a common ground of rules and understanding for how we think as a society. In particular, as debates raged, advocates for so-called same-sex marriage arose. And so states like our commonwealth, right, began passing legislation to affirm the traditional view of marriage. On November 7th, 2006, our commonwealth passed the following amendment, and it's still on the books. Article 1, Bill 1 of Rights, Section 15A, Marriage, quote, that only a union between one man and one woman may be a marriage valid in our or recognized by this commonwealth and its political subdivisions, end quote. But of course, the Supreme Court handed down the Obergefell decision in June of last year. That extended or created the right to marry for, quote, same-sex couples, legalizing same-sex marriage. This decision effectively redefined marriage, contradicted state amendments, and contradicted centuries, millennia worth of tradition and practice. The court necessarily moved from that fundamental aspect in marriage that's this complement and this permanent union of a man and woman to a new foundation that's actually never clearly defined, simply seems to be the union of two committed people. Now, while many rejoiced at this decision, many others mourned and lamented the downgrade of an institution that's so central to the fabric of our society. Furthermore, the dissenting judges themselves on the court said that This decision about marriage definition came from the, quote, rule of nine lawyers on the Supreme Court. From these things, confusion in our society now abounds on marriage's real significance and its meaning, what it is, its definition. So who gets to define marriage? To come to understand marriage's definition, to understand its significance, we got to turn to the one who made it our creator. And I don't bring this up to dig at our government or trying to recognize marriage or to consider it. How can they not? Again, this is the most fundamental relationship building block of our very society. I'm not faulting them there. And we can leave that discussion for another time. But for us, the church, those redeemed by Christ and those who are followers of him, how are we to think about marriage? How does, how did God design in order marriage for us? What is marriage from the one who made it? Which is our question this morning. So we're turning here to Genesis 2, and we're going to see this, particularly looking at the last few verses of the chapter. And we're going to see, I want you to rediscover the meaning of marriage from Genesis 2. And we're going to see that as we uncover four bedrock features of God's design in marriage. So we're going to look at marriage afresh from Genesis 2, especially these last verses, and you're going to see four foundational bedrock truths that form and inform how we think about marriage, how God designed marriage, and how he ordered it. And if we can get a grasp on this as the church, it's going to produce, I trust, numerous things, but here's three, that it would strengthen our union, our own marriages, that two, it would protect the unity of the marriages around us, because we know what marriage is for, we know how important this is, we know how foundational this is, what it is, what the proper boundaries are. But in the end, it would really increase our longing for a more perfect union, a more perfect marriage, a marriage with the perfect spouse, the perfect partner, the one who will never leave us 
or forsake us. That is looking, of course, to Christ, the church's groom. So I want these applications, these big picture applications to be swirling in our minds as we think through what is God doing in marriage? And we're going to see that in the text as we look at these four foundational truths. And so here's the outline as we work through the text this morning, these four bedrock features of marriage. Number one, we're going to see the gift of marriage. First thing, a little bit where we were last time. Uh, Number two, we're going to see the commitment that marriage makes, the commitment that creates marriage. Then number three, we're going to see the roles within marriage, the responsibilities given to the man and the wife. And then finally, we're going to conclude with what's been done in marriage. Oneness has been created. The oneness created by marriage. So as we go back and think about these four bedrock features, we start here with the gift of marriage. The first bedrock truth, and this is what we rehearsed last time, last week, But the first bedrock truth about marriage is this, is that marriage is a gift. It's a gift given to us by God, to humanity, to us, to his creation. And so as we consider our own marriages, we must hold fast to this truth, this reality that marriage is a good gift from a good God for our good and his glory. Marriage is a good gift from a good God given to us for our good and for his glory. So look at this as you look at verse 23 there, Genesis 2. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. We talked about this last time, but simply recall that as God made marriage, really as he made us, he made us from the get-go, out of the gate, he made us to be relational. He made us, by design, to lack something of ourselves that we needed someone else. Namely, we needed a spouse. We needed another. Remember from verse 18, which we just looked at. Then the Lord God said, looking at his perfect creation thus far, seemingly, it's not good. And what's not good? That man should be alone. Man, by God's wisdom and his creative design, made man in some way incomplete in himself. He needs, it's not good, he needs something. He needs another. And of course, God brings all the animals to Adam, and Adam names them all. And at the end of verse 20, we discover there's not found a helper fit for him. None of those other creatures relate to Adam in this way. They are not a helper fit for him. They do not meet his aloneness. And so with love and care, God provides. He provides man with this perfect partner. And we see... The gift that marriage is, as you look at the insta reaction, so to speak, of Adam. So, verse 22, the woman is brought to the man. And then verse 23, he, here is Adam's immediate response. And the man said, this is love at first sight, right? This at last, bone of my bones. This is like nothing I've seen before. This is incredible. She's amazing. Finally, the one I've been waiting for. As we recall, this is the first instance of poetry clearly in the Bible. It's on Adam's lips, writing, as it were, this first song to his love. And marriage is a gift. We see it here with Adam. It's a joyous, precious, generous, joy-inducing gift. And we see this throughout the Bible. In particular, we think of the book of Song of Solomon. And that's what that book is teaching us. It's teaching us to rediscover The kind of joy that God designed for and puts in marriage. Song of Solomon chapter 4. You've captivated my heart, my sister, my bride. You've captivated my heart with one glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace. How beautiful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much better is your love than wine and the fragrance of your oils than any spice. Or Song of Solomon chapter 2. My beloved is mine and I am his. And I would read more, but I think I'd start blushing. Man needed a companion. And God didn't give him simply a lover or just a friend, but the ultimate companion, a lover and a friend in one. What a gift. Do you see your marriage this way still? That God gave you a real companion to fulfill your aloneness. He didn't give you 
simply a cook or a launderer or a womb or a nurse. He didn't give you simply a paycheck, a handyman, a co-parent or protector. He gave you a companion, a closest companion, a lover and a friend. This complete gift to delight us and stir us up in thankfulness to God and also just affections to our spouse and this gracious gift he's given. So cherish and protect this relationship, this gift of marriage from God to you if he has gifted you with it. For your sake and for others, protect this gift of marriage. But we see this next aspect This other bedrock truth of marriage is that it's a commitment. We're looking at this commitment that makes marriage. The most fundamental component about marriage, that which truly joins the man and woman into this new union, it's this. It's a commitment. It's a covenant promise from one man to one woman to be together forever, at least in this life. As long as they live. This covenant, this promise, this oath to one another before God, this is what makes a marriage. This is where marriage begins. Marriage is built upon this promise. Well, where do we see that here in the text? Well, look here in verse 23. Then the man said, this at last. And then focusing on this, these terms here. Bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Now, as we start to read through Scripture, we understand this, that Adam's statement about bones of my bones and flesh of my flesh, he's saying more than simply, this is where you came from. He's not simply stating a realization about the source of Eve, that she literally came from out of him, which, of course, she did. But this term, as it's picked up in the Bible, bones of my bones and flesh of my flesh, that you are my bone and flesh and bone, this is covenant language. This is a statement of promise and commitment. Turn with me, if you would, carefully to 2 Samuel chapter 5. So you're going to wait right in your Bibles, but before the Psalms, and if you're in Chronicles or Kings, you've gone just a little too far. But 2 Samuel chapter 5. As you're turning there, let me remind you of the context here. David, so far, he's been reigning as king over Judah. That's the southern kingdom. He has yet to reign over all of Israel, which he will shortly do. And what we see here in 2 Samuel 5 is where the rest of the tribes of Israel show up at David's door, so to speak, and they are going to anoint David to be king, not just over one tribe, but over the whole nation of Israel. Now understand again, Judah is the tribe of David. This is his lineage where he comes from. He is not of the other tribes. He's not so closely related to them as he is to the tribe of Judah. And yet we pick it up here. 2 Samuel 5, verse 1. Then all the tribes of Israel, okay, again, that's all the tribes, not even simply those related to him by blood. These ones are not, so to speak. All the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, Behold, now notice what they say, we are your bone and flesh. They're not saying we are your relatives because those in Judah are his closest relatives. They are saying, we are committing ourselves to you, to your rule. We are willingly becoming your subjects. We are willingly putting ourselves under your rule and authority. We are as good as family now as you lead us. Continuing on there, verse 2. In times past, the tribes are saying, when Saul was king over us, it was you who led out and brought in Israel. And the Lord said to you, you are the shepherd of my people, Israel, and you should be prince over Israel. Verse 3. So all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron and King David. And what did they do? They made a covenant. They made a promise. That's the result of this language, flesh and bone. A covenant promise is made. An oath that is binding these two parties together. This is a pact, an agreement that has taken these two groups and made them into a relationship. A covenant relationship. And so they consequently anointed King David over Israel. So back to Genesis 2. Adam's not saying, hey, looking at Eve for the first time, you look familiar. You look like you're made of the same stuff I am, though that's true. 
But he's saying more than that. He's saying, you're mine and I am yours. I'm committing my life to you and you are to me. In these words, Adam is binding himself, committing himself, oathing himself to Eve. This is what makes a marriage. And we understand this as we continue on in the text. Look there at verse 24. So Genesis 2, 24 now. And look at the language here. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now, notice the language, the verbs there describing what makes a marriage. This covenant commitment. First off, there's leaving. A man shall leave his father and his mother. Or other translations at different times will translate the word forsake. It says covenant forsaking, in a sense. But this other word I'm going to hone in on. You leave, and then what else do you do? You hold fast, or you are united to. That word hold fast there. We see it occur, guess what, in 2 Samuel, but this time in chapter 20. We read in verse 1 of 2 Samuel 20 this. Now there happened to be there a worthless man whose name was Sheba, the son of Bichri, a Benjamite. And he blew the trumpet and said, We have no portion in David. We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tent, O Israel. So Sheba's rising up against David, who's king over everything, who the Israelites themselves covenanted together. And he's essentially saying, break off the covenant, break off the relationship, separate from David, which they go and do for a time. But as we keep reading in 2 Samuel 2, it rehearses for us, excuse me, Second Samuel chapter 20, verse 2. Rehearses for us the tribe that sticks with David, Judah, their loyalty and faithfulness. Second Samuel 20, verse 2. So all the men of Israel withdrew from David and followed Sheba, the son of Bichri. And this is the key text here. But the men of Judah followed their king steadfastly from the Jordan to Jerusalem. That word followed their king steadfastly. That's the same word here from Genesis 2 of hold fast. It's this covenant, relational commitment and binding to one another. Judah followed through. They remained loyal. They stuck by their king. And this isn't just talking about proximity. This is talking about relationship. Both of these terms from Genesis 2 here, leave and hold fast, these describe a covenant commitment, a promise for one to be with the other, to be devoted and united together. This is what makes a marriage. Does that change the way you look at marriage? Is that how you think about it? Certainly our culture, notions and and bonds to marriage, they list more about feelings of affection and attraction or even pragmatically, our culture just says, well, but marriage benefits me personally so much. That's why I'm committed to it. So in our culture, the reasons for still staying married are because your affections for this other person are so strong. Or because you see such a direct benefit for you from this other person. That there's more advantages sticking together than separating from them. But that's worlds apart from the way God designed and ordered marriage. The basis and the ground of marriage, that which makes your marriage, that which makes it and sustains it, is not affections and feelings and attractions that fluctuate and fade and ebb. Nor is it the seeming immediate benefit you think you're going to get in it. As if the words in sickness or for poorer or for worse only meant when it's convenient to your personal goals. I don't hear that in many vows. No, the basis and foundation of your marriage is a promise. It's a covenant promise that says, I am giving myself all to you forever in this life. It's a covenant promise before God that the two of you will be together in unity. The promise to be one another's companion to be one another's help and lover and friend. Always in sickness and health, for richer, for poorer, for better, for worse. 
Is that evident to your spouse today? That you are committed to them. That you will, by God's grace, never leave them, never forsake them, either physically or by leaving. Leaving them emotionally or relationally. Perhaps you're under the same roof, but you've checked out. That is missed what God has done in marriage. How might you strengthen your commitment to your promise and show to your spouse that you're still all in to the end as long as God would give it? Well, a part of that will mean being faithful to what God has called you in marriage, which is where now we turn. We turn to the roles, the roles that God has given in marriage back here in Genesis 2. This third foundational truth that informs our understanding of marriage is these roles, these accompanying responsibilities that God has given each spouse, the man and the woman, the husband and wife in marriage. And we see this taking shape as we continue there in verse 23. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. We see the husband here, he's naming his wife. This language here parallels for us the same language we saw in verses 19 and 20. Remember when all the animals were being brought before Adam, he names them because he was exercising his created authority, his designated authority from God over the animals. This is the way that Adam was imitating God. God, of course, naming all of creation in chapter 1. So Adam names the animals as part of his exercise of authority. And so in a way, he's doing that here with the wife. He's naming her, naming the woman. Now, this should not be taken that the the husband has authority over his wife in the same way that he wields authority over the animals as he tames and orders them. The husband's not to dominate the wife, though he's the leader and the one in authority. Well, why not? The parallel looks pretty strong. Or we call first that a man and woman are made in God's image. That they have both been given authority. They've both been commissioned with the mission to rule over all the earth together. He's not to rule the earth by himself, but he's to rule with the queen wife, the queen woman. This is a joint effort, a team project. And furthermore, what kind of relationship does the wife have to the husband For what purpose was she made? She was made to be a helper, but a helper that corresponds to him, that fits with him. In that sense, has an equal with him, his his companion, not his slave. They're a team. Though he's the leader, he has a role. The husband's not to subjugate or enslave or force obedience upon her. That dishonors who she is, is made in God's image. And her role as a companion. But with that said, we do recognize here that there is indeed an authority structure. There are roles and responsibilities given in marriage particular to the husband and particular to the wife. The husband is the leader. The wife is the helper. We see that in a few ways here in the text. One is that she is made second. To come alongside and then be a helper for the man. Or we'll note this in Genesis 2 verses 16 and 17. You just look up there. God gives these commands. And notice who he commands. Verse 16, And the Lord commanded the man, saying, The man is the one in charge. He's the one with the authority. The buck stops with him, for good and for bad, as we find. Right? And notice these commands as they're given. It's maybe not apparent to us, looking only at the English. It says, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. When he commands, you shall eat and you shall not eat, in the Hebrew, it's clear, he's talking to a singular man, a male. He's talking to Adam. Adam's the one particular responsible. He is the one given the authority. The buck stops with him. And of course, he is the one primarily responsible, even as he then sins. And we find in chapter 3, Where, of course, it goes through this series, working back about who who did what. But once we get to God's judgment in verse 17 of chapter 3, he says this. Because you listened to the voice of your wife, okay, obeyed her, 
which again was upsetting the structure, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, Adam particularly, you shall not eat. Cursed is the ground because of you. The curse has come because of Adam's sin in particular. He was the one in authority. He was the one responsible. And these roles continue as we go through the Bible. Things don't change. This isn't simply just ancient Near Eastern culture. We see this play out in the New Testament, right? Colossians 3, verse 18. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean that the husband, because he has authority, he should abuse it, as the text continues. Colossians 3, 19. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. And this is nothing about the weighty passages that we studied in Ephesians 5, where Husbands are commanded to love their wives as Christ does the church. But what this does mean is this, is that there are roles in marriage. And they are rooted in the very first marriage, in God's design for marriage. For the wife, she is to submit and respect her husband. Or more particularly, you can look at it, these three responsibilities. The wife is to follow her husband. She is to called to follow her husband's leadership and authority. You let him lead, and you go where he takes you. So presuming your husband is not leading you into disobedience towards Christ, then you, his follower, you don't don't have an out or a choice to say, fine, you go do that. You make that bad, unwise decision and see how that goes for you. As the wife, you're called to submit to his authority and follow him presuming it's not in direct disobedience to Christ. You're not living out your submission to Christ if you're not submitting to your husband. Secondly, she is to be a companion to her husband. You're to pursue him as a friend, as a help fit for him. You're to stick with him in the tough times to help him, to comfort him, to help him navigate and use his authority well to get through the difficulties in life that we will encounter. Thirdly, she is to respect her husband. How do you speak of your husband to others? How do you speak about him in front of your children or to your children? Does this encourage God's ordained authority in your home? Or do you look for and highlight and encourage his successes as a husband, as a man, as a leader, as, a, as how he's serving you? Or are you more prone to nagging and fault finding and a reminding of failures? Husband has responsibilities too. He's to lead and sacrifice himself for his wife. Three responsibilities for the husband can be put like this. Number one, he is to love his wife. Love like Christ, sacrificing himself. Laying down his life for the good of his wife and his family. This kind of love looks like service. Putting her good Her physical, spiritual, and emotional good over your ease, convenience, your plans, your hobbies. You're loving your own flesh. Number two, the husband's to love by learning about his wife continually. Right? Like we read in 1 Peter. Live with your wife in an understanding way. You need to know her. You need to figure her out. Understand what she's thinking. That takes communication. Words have to be passed from one to the other. I think both sides need to hear that. You need to understand what motivates her, what scares her, what gives her hope and how she feels. And then lovingly providing the care and leadership she needs that's to cater just for her. Finally, as we've said, number three, the husband's to lead his wife. The buck stops with him. He is the one responsible. He makes the final decisions. And as a loving leader, he'll know and understand how to best lead. He'll know what his wife thinks, what she thinks is best and why, and try and make the best decisions for her good, to best serve his wife, to bring most honor to Christ. But now to scope back, so these are the responsibilities, and this is how we'll best serve one another in marriage and protect our marriages. This just coincides, these roles and responsibility just show us this is why God made marriage. It's about companionship. It's about being there for one another. It's about serving each other, being 
most helpful to each other as a friend, as a lover and companion. And we'll do that best as we embrace these roles. But that comes to really the crux of what marriage is, and it's this. It's this oneness created by marriage. What is marriage? Marriage is this union between a man and a woman in their promise where the two now become one. So we look there, and now Genesis 2, verse 24. Therefore, this is a key transition. We've been looking at the first marriage and drawing just principles for our lives based on it, which is fair. But now we're understanding the first marriage wasn't just about Adam and Eve. This was a transition to speak about all marriages. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. We're obviously not just looking at Adam, for he had no father and mother to leave. The first marriage was setting up a paradigm for all of us to understand what marriage is. And it consists in these three things, these three verbs of verse 24. To leave, to hold fast, and becoming one flesh. Or to leave and to cleave and to weave. Not original, but it's helpful for memory. First off, he leaves. And this is more than a spatial separation, right? Because even in the ancient Near Eastern context, which Moses would have been writing in, many times they didn't actually leave a house. The families were multi, or the homes were multi-generational. So what would leaving mean then? It's a switch of allegiance. It's a switch of affinity. And not again that the husband would abandon his parents, But the parental relationship, which has been so prominent, has been subordinated. It's been subordinated and put under this more foundational, this more central relationship, his new marriage. He's breaking out, again, from this prime allegiance to his parents, to a greater promise, a greater loyalty, a greater relationship with his wife. Because he's going to leave, but then he's going to cleave. He's going to hold fast to his wife. We talked about this word already. But it means more than simply intimacy, which that's pictured here. Physical intimacy, but it's a holding fast to a commitment, to a relationship, a binding together that cannot be ever separated. That is, this isn't some flighty or romantic emotion. This is a covenant. This is a promise, an oath to be bound together. And how bound are they together? What's this third part? This oneness, this weaving. They're so bound together, they're no longer even two. In a sense, before God, they're indistinguishable. They are one. And they shall become one flesh. Well, in what ways are they one? Well, there's many, but at least two. Physically, they become one flesh. In this covenant relationship, this exclusive relationship that binds a single man to a single woman for life, this exclusive bond gets portrayed in sexual intimacy. And this is alluded to here in verse 25. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. There is a full giving of oneself to your spouse and back and forth. Nothing is hidden. You're before one another, giving yourself to each other, which of course suggests this is before the fall. Intimacy was not a product of the fall. It's something good. It's a gift God created. It's not dirty or shameful in its proper context, according to the boundaries God has given, which is marriage. And and that's why those That kind of intimacy, it's reserved for male and female couples bound together through the covenant in marriage. And there alone, Hebrews 13 verse 4. Let marriage be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Sex is for marriage, period. Any sexual act outside the bond of marriage crosses God's command, crosses God's design and intention for it. In its ordained context, sex is a very good thing, but only there in marriage. 
Because outside of marriage, sexual intimacy is a false intimacy. Trying to steal and replicate something that can only be had in this exclusive relationship. The security there of this commitment of one to the other. And that's because the sexual union, even the physical one, it's much more, it's much more than simply that physical act. Because as they've been made one, they've been made one not just only physically, but also relationally. There's a relational union here. The marriage promise creates a relational commitment and this oneness between the husband and wife. In his book, Strengthening Your Marriage, Dr. Mack defines a marriage as, quote, a total commitment and a total sharing of the total person with another person until death. A total commitment and a total sharing of the total person with one another until death. And we see that here even in verse 25. And the man and his wife were both naked. But what's the relational thing that comes after it? But they were not what? They weren't ashamed. They were so one. They were so open. They were so together. There was no shame before them. There was nothing hidden. There was no threat of rejection. There was this relational security because they were one together. A total and open giving of themselves to each other. And again, this coincides entirely with what we saw. What is marriage about? It's about companionship. A total companion. Physically, relationally, emotionally. These two that are bound together by a promise, so now they have become one. So what is marriage? What does marriage produce? It takes two. A male and a female that are separate and distinct. And the marriage promise binds them into one, one flesh. Not just even one team, but one permanent, inseparable, totally given to one another relationship. In marriage, God binds the two into one. Now, though this oneness, this this is inherent in marriage. This is inherently true about every marriage, according to the scripture But living out and enjoying the fruits of this oneness are not easy. It's not automatic. You're automatically, if you're bound together to a man and a wife in marriage, you're automatically one before God in this union, but you're not automatically enjoying it. That's because of sin. The unity and roles in marriage, they're, they're disrupted as a consequence and curse for our sin. We see it in Genesis 3. We'll talk more about these things. You see it there in Genesis 3, verse 7, where sin immediately interrupts the security, the openness, and the unity of the first marriage. He takes of the fruit and eats it. And then verse 7, then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And then we see they're also hiding from God, apparently one another. To bring two sinners together, two selfish people, two self-seeking people, two me-first people, and to bring those types together guarantees sin, (laughs) conflict, disruption, distance, and difficulties. And the pain of these difficulties can be all the more multiplied because you're being violated or betrayed by someone so close to you. But the case isn't hopeless. The benefits of joys and marriage can be recaptured. But what's needed? Grace, mercy, forgiveness. That's so hard. How can I do that? How can I be gracious and forgiving to another that's wronged me? When I, when I was so giving, I put myself so out there, I was so vulnerable. I know it's hard. But it doesn't really matter about me. Most importantly, your father, your heavenly father knows how hard this is. And he is only asking that you imitate him in this comparatively small way of how he's been merciful to you. To forgive like he has forgiven you. But if I just forgive, what that's going to cost me may cost you a whole lot. Your pride, your justice, your reputation, your standing, maybe your credibility. 
but it will never cost the price that he paid for you to bring you back to him. Overcome your sin and the sin of your spouse by grace, by showing grace, triumphing with mercy, showing forgiveness, replicating something of that amazing, the boundless, the magnificent grace that Christ gives to rebels and sinners like all of us. Because if that's happening in our marriages, then what will our marriages be doing? Ephesians 5, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two will become one flesh. This mystery is profound and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and his church. We will be putting the gospel on display if we can show the kind of grace that we've been given to our spouses. That's what marriage is all about. It's a foretaste of the completeness and companionship that we can ultimately only have in him and which he's given us in the gospel. Marriage is all about this, a picture of Christ's love and his commitment to us, the wayward bride. That is what marriage is about. Marriage exists for the glory of God, broadcasting through all of our unions, something of this closeness, this companionship, this sacrifice and love that he has given in the cross. How are our marriages doing in telling that story? How are our marriages? Is there grace there? May we plant seeds of kindness and patience, and forgiveness, and mercy into our marriage so the gospel can grow and be seen and be shown. Let's pray. We wonder, Father, how we can do this. We cast ourselves on you, and we recognize and admit our failures. We are sinners still, but we thank you for your spirit. We thank you that Jesus died for us. We thank you for forgiveness. We ask for it now. Forgive us for our selfishness. Forgive us for our sin. 